Whenever we communicate, whether speaking or writing, or even making pictures or gestures, there are choices that we make. What information do I want to include? What language do I want to use? How do I want to present myself to others? In what mode do I want to present my ideas? The choices that we make when we communicate are dictated by the rhetorical situation. Now, while we may discuss the various facets of the rhetorical situation, there are three main components to focus on. First and foremost, audience. Who are you communicating with or who do you want to reach with your message? Different audiences will have different needs and expectations of us. Indeed, we have different relationships with different groups of people, some we know well, some we don't know well, some we like, some we are wary of, and we communicate differently with all these groups. And particularly as they have different wants and expectations of us, if we want to reach each of them with our message, we need to address them differently. Think about it. You don't speak to your mom the same way you speak to your boss. Indeed, you probably don't speak to your mom the same way you speak to your dad. I know my six-year-old son certainly doesn't speak to mommy and daddy in the same way. He's already learned that. Um, you don't address your boss the same way in which you talk to your friends. And certainly you don't want to speak to that cute person you just met at the bar the same way you speak to your best buds. So the choices for what we say and how we say it varies for each of these audiences. The second main component of the rhetorical situation is purpose. What is your goal for communicating or what are you trying to accomplish? The other way to think about this is, what do you want your audience to understand or consider or do afterwards? We typically think of purpose in terms of broad categories such as informing or persuading or entertaining, but there may be a variety of purposes for communicating or writing and certainly much more specific outcomes or responses that we'd like from our audience. Again, there are different choices in content, language, and tone that we use based on our reason for communication. It is one thing to tell your parents all about a concert that is happening in Atlanta next weekend and the band and their music and how wonderful it will be, but this is different than what you would say and how you would say it if you were trying to convince your parents to let you go to Atlanta next weekend to attend the concert. The third main component of the rhetorical situation is persona. Essentially, how do you want to present yourself to your audience? Do you want to seem knowledgeable, professional? Do you want to seem passionate, non-biased? Do you want to be witty or sarcastic, seem like a fun guy? Consider the audience you want to reach and your purpose for communicating. What would be the best way to present yourself to reach this audience and have them respond the way you want them to? Again, this will also dictate the choices you make in language, tone, and content. Even when we have the same story to tell, the rhetorical situation dictates what we say and how. For example, let's say you're babysitting your five-year-old niece Susie while your brother and sister-in-law are away for the weekend, and Saturday morning her puppy runs out of the house and into the road, and a UPS driver comes barreling down the street and runs over her puppy. Now, we can assume for this example uh, that Susie did not see this event and that the puppy also did not survive. Now, the different audiences you tell about this situation and your reason for doing so will certainly influence what you say and how you say it. First, what are you going to tell little Susie? Certainly, you need to let her know that her puppy's not coming back, and you will want to help comfort and guide her through this trauma. But how much does she understand about life and death? How will you help explain this to her? Or do you avoid the subject altogether? Now, you don't want to describe the scene in graphic detail, and it would be best to avoid philosophical dis discussions of life and death. You probably also don't want to break down in front of her and cry. Now, Susie has some very specific wants and needs in the situation. Thus, you will need to speak in language she can understand, be compassionate, maybe talk about puppy heaven, and also let her know that you are strong and that she can rely on you to help get her through this. Next, your brother and sister-in-law are a different audience with different needs and expectations. You certainly need to inform them of the situation, but you also want to let them know that while you feel sorry and responsible, this was an accident and that you have done everything you can to take care of the situation. You certainly want them to still respect you after this and, you know, invite you to Thanksgiving dinner and, and other family events. Being aloof and dismissive of the situation probably would not create family harmony. So instead, 
you will probably be frank and upfront describing what happened and how, what you tried to do while sounding apologetic and letting them know that you've done all that you can to take care of Susie and help her through this. If you were to write a letter to UPS about this incident, you will again want to consider your audience and purpose. First, they are a big company that probably get lots of complaints, so you will want to consider what your concerns are, why they need to know about these concerns, and what you want them to do about these concerns. Also, you want to be sure they take you seriously and don't just dismiss your letter and toss it into the circular file. Thus, while you may be angry or upset, and you may let a little of that seep in, you will want to be professional and try to maintain an even measured tone throughout. Certainly, no name calling. Um, you will want to be specific about your concerns. You know, was the driver speeding? Did the driver stop afterwards? And why do they need to know about this? Maybe drivers could be better trained or reminded that they're driving in neighborhoods where there may be children who could dart into the road. Now, Monday morning around the water cooler when you and your coworkers want to gossip and avoid getting started working that week, what would you say to a coworker who asked, hey, how was your weekend? Now, this is a much different audience, and you would have a much different purpose to engage in light banter with your coworkers. So depending on where you work and what's appropriate and your relationship with your coworkers, this could be an opportunity to open up a little bit more and be a little bit lighter about the subject. You know, kind of the, oh God, you would not believe the weekend that I have. Um, and maybe details like, you know, the worst part is when I had to go out with a shovel and scrape guts off the street before Susie woke up. Um, you know, because this does not actually involve your coworkers, they're less likely to be offended by this kind of tone and these kinds of details. And it's actually would be more appropriate for the kind of water cooler story uh, that they're looking for on Monday morning. And thus, while you have the same story to tell here, the different audiences that you have and your different purposes for telling the story, as well as the different way that you want your audience to perceive you, makes the story and how you tell it different in each of these circumstances. Now, the other thing is we don't just consider the rhetorical situation when we communicate. We don't just talk about it when we talk about what we do to communicate, but we also talk about this with things that we read or watch. Now, when you read a news story or, or an essay um, or even a textbook, or when you listen to a politician speaking on the floor of Congress or a preacher speaking on Sunday morning, what helps us better understand what they're saying is to consider the rhetorical situation for this writer or speaker. Who are they writing or speaking for and trying to reach? What is their purpose for writing or speaking? And how is this influencing the choices that they make and what they say and how they say it? Um, so certainly, if we are not their intended audience, then how are we supposed to receive this message and better understand what is being said and why? Um, and so knowing the rhetorical situation can help us have a better understanding of what's being communicated by the people you know, for their intended audience with their intended purpose. Anyway, I hope this provides a little clearer understanding of these rhetorical concepts and that you'll start thinking about the rhetorical situation both with what you yourself communicate as well as with the messages that you receive.